I'm with you, dude. I'm willing to take this trip with okay, you. Okay, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I'd like, I'd like to invite you to consider this possibility, this way of looking at ecosystem monitoring. For some people, that is just going to be too wacky. It's too far out. And that's okay. There's another way. If meditation isn't your thing, I'd like to introduce you to a conceptual model. So a good way to start is before you jump into what methods you want to use or what metrics you want to measure is to first take a step back and try to organize your thoughts about, so uh, if we're managing a forest and our goal is for it to have a complex structure, you can flip around and think of that as a question. If we do a prescribed burn, does it create complex structure? If we do a thinning treatment, does that create the structure that we're looking for? And that kind of question is what can guide really high quality ecosystem monitoring. Welcome back to Tree Hugger Podcast, where we explore the vital connections between ecological restoration, human health and livelihoods, and justice in a warming world. Today, we have a special guest joining us right in the heart of a beautiful forest setting in Point Defiance Park. We recorded this back in the summer. He was down to hang out in one of my favorite sit spots. It's an honor to introduce Dylan Mendenhall, the owner of Haven Ecology and Research. Dylan's background is steeped in ecology, growing up around the urban old growth forests of Seattle and later dedicating his career to ecosystem monitoring, conservation, and restoration. Before we dive in, I want to thank all of you, our listeners, for your continuous support. Your enthusiasm for these conversations drives us to bring diverse voices like Dylan's to the forefront. We're thrilled to have you with us, and we appreciate you for tuning in, sharing, and keeping these conversations alive. I think Dylan is a bit of a legend in the ecological restoration community. He's part of a lineage of Seattle forest stewards and brings a wealth of knowledge and innovative approaches to ecosystem monitoring. Today, we'll explore the ins and outs of ecosystem monitoring, from fundamental practices to some truly exciting technological innovations. In this episode, Dylan breaks down ecosystem monitoring, explaining it as the study of how ecosystems change over time. From tracking biodiversity to observing environmental stressors, monitoring serves as an essential tool for understanding and supporting ecosystem health. We get into techniques and geek out a little bit about technology, Dylan talks about tools like eDNA for detecting species and new molecular techniques like phospholipid fatty acids analysis, which reveal stress levels in microbial communities. He also discusses how AI and remote sensing methods like LIDAR are shaping a new era in ecological research. And with years of experience, Dylan discusses how to build effective monitoring programs. He knows that the importance of having well-defined questions and robust data practices are super important. He highlights the need for consistency in methods and how a passionate advocate within an organization can drive successful long-term monitoring projects. Today's conversation is an inspiring reminder of our connection to the ecosystems around us. As Dylan says, we are the forest and each of us plays a part in its story. It's a great conversation, so settle in for a while. My name is Dylan Mendenhall. I'm the owner of Haven Ecology and Research, a small, powerful environmental consulting firm. Our mission is to help our community get insight into our natural resources and just help folks make good land management decisions. And I often, I know you're withholding a few things. I know a lot about you. I usually refer to you as one of the OG forest stewards in Seattle. <laughs> I don't know if how much you want to divulge about yourself, but your family was very integral in like the early, I would say early days of restoration and care for Schmidt's Preserve Park. Is that right? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, I don't want to tell the story for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a big part of my story. I grew up running around in a remnant old growth forest just in the heart of Seattle. A lot of folks don't even know it's there. So that was a big formative experience. And later, my family got more involved with the stewardship of that forest kind of in the early budding days of the Green Seattle Partnership. So that's where I learned a lot about old growth ecology and forest management just through direct experience. I actually reminded of, I was rereading one of my early journals when I was a child and 
I was recounting a field trip that the class took out to one of our local parks, and they were explaining, oh, this is a fern. It doesn't have flowers. Oh, here's a another bush. It does produce flowers. And in my journal at the time, I was frustrated that they were explaining these things. And in, I think I wrote something like, you just learned that by by watching. Yeah, yeah. You have to explain that to you. Different types of plant types. Like I have a kid, he's 13, and so I feel like he has kind of a long leash. Did you grow up just like at will so you could just like bug out and dip out and just go into the forest? I was definitely one of those free-range children. Yeah, we would spend long days out in the woods building forts, and um, we had this idea in our heads that we were out there working in the woods, and then we'd come home and just covered in dirt and pine needles and That's what a weekend looked like for me. Yeah, Getting work done. (laughs) So obviously, for ecological monitoring, this is a huge topic, right? So it could depend on your little niche in ecology. It could really, it could mean a lot of different things. In a few words, maybe just to start off, what's crucial for effective ecosystem monitoring? Yeah, well, maybe, maybe we could just start with what is ecological monitoring? Yeah. I would say that ecological monitoring or ecosystem monitoring is just quite simply looking at how an ecosystem changes over time. That can be kind of hard to define. Maybe it's easier to describe some of the things that ecosystem monitoring isn't. So, for example, doing casual site revisits. That's not ecological monitoring. That's, it's not consistent. It's not repeatable. It's not producing information that is accrued over time and that we can use to analyze and build like a shared knowledge ecosystem monitoring, it's not doing simulation work, it's not doing modeling, where we use powerful algorithms to sort of imagine what Mm. an ecosystem, how it changes over time. Ecological monitoring is also not other forms of research. For example, space for time studies, where we look at variation over the landscape as a proxy for how an ecosystem changes through time. So that's not ecological monitoring. Because ecological monitoring is, it's very active. It's in the here and now. We're looking at how an ecosystem is actively changing. And I would also say that ecological monitoring isn't simply measuring anything out in the environment. So if you think of like air quality monitoring, if you there's wildfire smoke and you want to look up what the AQI is, that's not ecosystem monitoring. That's, I would call that just under a broader umbrella of environmental monitoring. It's not giving us information about what is happening in an ecosystem, the components and and the processes, the structure and the diversity of an ecosystem, how those are changing. So it's long-term. It's more than a snapshot in in time. But that that temporal scale is really going to change depending on the type of ecosystem that we're looking at. So if we were looking at, say, a microbial community in kombucha, for example, that's used as a a model system for studying ecological secession. What ecological monitoring might look like there would be on timescales of hours or days, perhaps. Whereas if we're looking at something with a longer time span or longer cycles, like a redwood forest, well, in that case, I'm not even sure we're capable of doing ecosystem monitoring because those trees can live for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Nice, man. That was great. All right. What do you think were some key indicators of maybe a healthy ecosystem for you that stand out to you? Maybe, for example, like where we're sitting right now. Ecosystem health is very hard to define. I want to say we know it when we see it, but it's a lot easier to describe an ecosystem in terms of how it's being degraded. I think ecosystem health is very subjective. It really depends on the management goals of that particular landscape or ecosystem or perhaps the particular species of interest that we're trying to conserve or that we're concerned about. So most of my background is in forest ecology, so looking at at, um, terrestrial ecosystems. And I actually, I don't see a lot of folks doing this, but what I'm looking for are the little guys. Some people say the little guys run the world. And we're talking about the fungi, the microbial communities, the pollinators that are really fundamentally performing the ecological processes that we depend on, whether it's decomposition or pollination or seed dispersal. So what I look for are signs that those processes are happening. I, When you see a garden that's just 
covered in bees. You know, something's working there. When you see a forest that's just full of bird song, you know something's working there. If we're managing for, say, old growth characteristics, I'm looking for tree regeneration. So looking at the tiny seedlings coming up in the understory. If that's not happening, there's something wrong. Good. I mean, that's kind of why I brought you to this spot, because this is like in Tacoma. I feel like the highest regen of like trees that I know about right now. So I want to think about maybe the ceremony of monitoring, like what happens when you go out in the field, like in tools in your toolbox. Like, what does that look like? What does it look like for you when you're getting ready and actually go out in the field? Like a day in the life? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, That would probably start with... Cup of chai. Yeah, cup of chai, play with the cats, feed the cats. But when I'm really starting to get rolling, put together my backpack. So if I'm out doing a forest inventory project or some sort of plot-based sampling in a terrestrial environment, um, a whole lot of tools for measuring the structure of the forest. So we use a DBH tape for measuring the diameter of trees. We use a laser hypsometer for measuring the height of trees or other structures along the bowl of a tree. I use a hori hori knife for cutting through the soil profile and measuring the depth of different soil horizons. With field work, we always very concerned about safety. So we dress based on the hazards that we're expecting in whatever the particular environment is. So if we're working in some place that's very exposed, we're often very concerned about solar radiation. If it's steep slopes or forested terrain, we're thinking about things that might fall on top of us or us being able, taking a tumble down down a steep slope. So having comfortable, sturdy shoes, long sleeve pants, and a hard hat, those are some of the basics. Even when I don't necessarily have a lot of gear that might require a field vest, I almost always wear a bright orange vest. It just, it puts people at ease when they see some guy out in the woods running around hugging trees. Yeah. Puts people at ease. It does, yeah. Uh, when I was an undergrad, I learned pretty quickly that if you wanted to go do some field surveys, public property, private property, if you're wearing a field vest, people just look the other way. Provides a little bit of authority, justification for you being there. Yeah. Some people, I think, may think ecosystem monitoring relates to, like, high technology. Like, how common are some of the tools that you mentioned in, mm. in your practice? Or is there a new technology that has, like, revolutionized ecosystem oh, yeah. monitoring lately? It's Honestly, it's just an incredible time to be alive on this planet. There's so many tools available for studying the natural world from very small scales, like the molecular, up to more of a macroscopic level, like things that we can look at and touch with our hands up to a landscape level, Landsat arrays that are constantly scanning the earth and collecting information on topography or other environmental parameters. So like at the molecular level, there's things like PLFAs, so phospholipid fatty acids. Those are molecules that are on the surface of uh, cellular membranes of just about every living organism I can think of. And they're used in ecological monitoring because they will often change in either in terms of the composition of an ecosystem or in terms of environmental stressors. So, for example, uh, certain kinds of stress caused by pollution will change the composition of the PLFAs in a microbial community. And so those can be used for monitoring ecosystem health and inferring the impacts of pollution. Some of the, the biggest advances that we've had recently have been the development of eDNA for studying not just microbial life, but any organism that's out in the world. We're constantly shedding DNA just by virtue of interacting with the world around us. A really good example in the Pacific Northwest is how eDNA is used for monitoring salmon. So you can, for example, collect eDNA in a stream and confirm whether or not a particular salmon species is present in the entire watershed upstream from that point where the sample is collected. Uh, so th those have been some major advances. And then we talked a little bit about remote sensing, so like with land satellites as well as LIDAR that's run overhead. 
So these things like the PLFAs and the eDNA, is this something pretty common that's monitored or collected? It feels like kind of expensive and like high tech to me, or do you, do people pay you to do that? Or is this something that's like just kind of the cutting edge of monitoring right now? Oh, eDNA is being used, I want to say everywhere. It's incredibly widespread. The costs have come down a lot. I don't know if you remember back when there was the, a big push to sequence the human genome. Since then, the costs of sequencing have just dropped. And so now it's very accessible for organizations and land managers to use that to learn about the ecosystems that they're working in. So we do eDNA analysis at Haven, for example. So, you do? Yeah, so we prepare samples for sequencing and we analyze the data through our bioinformatics pipeline. I did not know that. What are things people are wanting to investigate when they contract you to do that sort of thing then? For example, looking at changes in endophytes, those are microbes that uh, live inside of plant tissue. Some of them are symbiotic, some of them might be pathogenic, some of them might be just hanging around for the riot. We can collect plant tissue or tissue from soil and learn um, about the entire microbial community in that ecosystem. In one of our current projects, we're trying to figure out what is causing this uh, apparent blight that's wiping out sword ferns in the Pacific Northwest. So we're collecting both tissue samples from sword ferns, so from the leaves, as well as from the soil. And rather than looking for a very specific organism, because it isn't known, we're sequencing all of the DNA, all of the environmental DNA, in the hopes of finding that needle in the haystack that we think is there, a pathogen. Mm. We're also working on a prototype for a new way of looking at eDNA. There are some researchers in Australia that figured out that you can use spider webs as a natural biofilter out in the landscape to collect DNA. So what they did was they collected spider webs, extracted DNA from it, and then they were able to infer the different animals that were in the environment. In order to show that they were definitely capturing the animals that were in the area around those spider webs, they also did the study at a zoo and where they collected the spider webs in different exhibits. And when they sequenced the DNA, they found kangaroos and zebras and other animals that are just imp- impossible to have shown up in the sequencing data if that DNA wasn't found in the samples. How the zebras and the kangaroos get hanging out together? Where the spider was like doing laps around the zoo. The DNA just, it floats through the air. It's oh. just, it's all around us. It's crazy because I'm looking at spider webs right now, like on the evergreen huckleberry and on the baby yeah, hemlocks so, and whatever. So potentially like our DNA is like floating around. Yeah. So getting attached, getting hung up in the, getting hung up in the spider webs. Yeah. And that study was done in Australia, but I see a lot of potential applications here in the Pacific Northwest. You can imagine if there's particular birds or mammals that are very difficult to study, it might be easier just to collect a spider web and sequence the DNA and see if they show up. Mm-hmm. So that's a service that we're currently prototyping. We're collecting spider webs and we're about to submit them for sequencing. Excellent. One of the intentions of the podcast was to expose people, especially like young students or people who are changing careers to ecological restoration. And so I'm just thinking about how this path that you've taken on your business sort of evolved? It seems really rewarding. What keeps the fire lit for you? Oh, yeah. So I finished my master's in forestry from the University of British Columbia, moved back home to Seattle, and this was right in 2020. And little did I know, there was an unprecedented pandemic about to just totally change our life, at least unprecedented in my lifetime. Everything shut down We were quarantined at home, and I thought, what the heck? Why not start a business? It was a big risk, but I thought, why not try? And things just took off, and I've been doing it ever since. So we serve a wide range of clients from small forest property owners to public land managers at federal and local agencies. Yeah, I don't think there's a lot of information out there about different career opportunities when people are navigating their way through school or through even career options or whatnot. Yeah, it's interesting to think about like you as a kind of ecopreneur, I would say, 
And then because uh, there's not only the technical know-how that you have, but you have people you employ and you have certain like ethics, I think, around how to run a business, that I think are, are really important. Yeah. Natural resources is a very challenging industry for someone to have a career. It's important work, whether you're doing habitat restoration or conservation or environmental research. And the work benefits everybody in our community. I almost want to say it's similar to a tragedy of the commons kind of situation because everyone benefits from the work that we do, but there's a lot of costs to do that work that aren't equally shared. So it takes investment from our community in order to make this work happen. All that's to say is that the jobs for doing this kind of work are in high demand. There's more people, more passionate, talented people competing for these jobs than there are jobs available, even though the need is so great. If anybody's ever interested in exploring a new career or doing a career change, I like to encourage people to try it out in some way. That can look like an internship, that can look like volunteering, or asking to shadow somebody. So try to like, try it out first, see if you like it. That's some of the biggest ad advice I have for people. The other thing, so we talked a little bit about how scarce jobs are in natural resource management, despite the fact that the need is so great and is not being met for our society. There's other ways of contributing to the cause without necessarily being a restoration ecologist. So if somebody's really good with numbers, I'm not, but accounting might be their thing. And if they're really passionate about that, every business, every organization needs somebody who can keep track of the books. And that can be an extraordinarily fulfilling way of contributing to the team. That's just one example. Yeah, it takes a whole team, right? It takes, a, for lack of a better cliche, like it takes a whole village to keep stuff move, keep stuff. It takes a village to raise the child that <laughs> is the land. <laughs> All right. Because I was thinking like some very specific questions about like how to go about collecting data about different methods. What's a gateway to ecological monitoring in your mind? Like you said, walking around the forest is definitely like a nitty gritty sort of way to put your naturalist hat on, right? But how can that actually then be the portal to more in-depth practice or the science? Sure, like how, how, where do you start? Yeah. Like how do you get started? So I guess we're going to get into essentially knowledge building and like how we know things about the world. So I'd like to offer a perspective on that before we get into the details of applying the scientific yeah, method yeah, yeah. in the context of natural resource management. Yeah, so I want to borrow from Aldo Leopold. Some people think of him as sort of the founder of this discipline of restoration ecology. And he asked us to think like a mountain. I want to share experience I had that kind of ties into that. So for my master's thesis, we're interested in looking at the trophic cascades caused by an invasive deer species on Haida Gwaii. It's an, op it's an archipelago right off the coast of BC. So there's no natural predators for the Sitka black-tailed deer. They're native to North America, but not to this archipelago where there aren't any mountain lions to keep their populations in check. So this is sort of the premise for a trophic cascade when you're missing a, a top predator in a food chain. So the invasive deer show up, and they eat everything. And I don't know if you knew this, but deer swim really well. Yeah. So they can swim over a mile in open ocean water. Mm -hmm. And so they've spread to nearly every island of the archipelago, and they eat. So the impacts that the invasive deer have had on the plant community are fairly obvious. They're, everything below the browse line in these areas that have been heavily impacted is gone. You see just lush, very beautiful carpets of moss, but nothing growing in it. So we're interested, if the deer have this profound impact on the composition of the plant community, what are the cascading impacts on the soil microbial community, the fungi, bacteria in the soil? So before I started this project, I wanted to just have more direct experience with the land that I was about to study. So I went on a solo kayak camping trip out on Haida Gwaii, kayaked out to a remote island and set up camp there. And I didn't know exactly what I was looking for, but I had one of the most profound spiritual experiences of my life out there. 
at one point I found myself just experiencing the world, looking at itself through my eyes, through my hands, and just felt incredibly connected to everything around me and felt just love and connection with everything. And I've tried to take that experience back into the work that I do. It left me with this very strong conviction that uh, we are the forest. We are this forest that we're stewarding. Right now, there's the forest of Bremerton, where I'm from, that's having a conversation with the forest of Tacoma, where you live. Carl Sagan said, we are a way for the cosmos to know itself. So we can't stay up on that spiritual mountain constantly we wouldn't get anything done if we were just constantly in a state of rapture and connection and, and joyful experience of being a part of nature but i think it's important that people think about those experiences of connection whether it was from partner dancing or singing in a choir or at church or going on an lsd trip or hanging out with their dog and playing fetch Take those moments of connection and bring that to the project that is ecological monitoring. Think like a mountain and try to empathize with this landscape that we want to study. Instead of thinking about knowledge as a uh, extractive process, like we're going to go discover something, we're going to go find that information and take it back. Think of knowledge building as a, a creative process. It's collaborative. And to think of the land that we're studying as one of the collaborators and bring them to the table. Okay, so that I'm with you, Dale. I'm willing to take this trip with okay, you. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I'd like I'd like to invite you to consider this possibility, this way of looking at ecosystem monitoring. For some people, that is just going to be too wacky. It's too far out, and that's okay. There's another way. If meditation isn't your thing, I'd like to introduce you to a conceptual model. So a good way to start is before you jump into what methods you want to use or what metrics you want to measure is to first take a step back and try to organize your thoughts about how you think this ecosystem works. What are the different components? What are the different inputs and outputs? What are the processes, the way those different components of the ecosystem interact with each other? And put it down on paper. Um, so this often looks like uh, something of a flow chart where people write down the inputs important parts of the system. Um, so in a forest, that might be, well, we'll take my master's research as an example. I start out um, drawing on the back of a napkin uh, in Sharpie pictures of all the animals and plants that I thought were really important components of these old growth forests on Haida Gwaii. Um, and I drew arrows and described how I thought they all interacted. And through this drawing, which I shared with my committee, I was able to both see some of the assumptions I was making about this landscape, but also um, learn some potential indirect connections between these different organisms. So for example, when we look at higher order interactions in ecology, you can see organisms that don't directly interact with each other. For example, if we look at um, acacia trees, they can grow thorns that house uh, ant colonies inside of them. The ants uh, protect the tree from predators, herbivores. There is a study done, this is one of my favorite examples of looking at higher order interactions in ecology. So in order to conserve the trees from some of these tall herbivores, like giraffes, they fenced off all of these trees to protect them from herbivores. And then they compared the mortality rates of the trees that were inside of the exclosures with the ones that were outside. Counterintuitively, they found that there were higher mortality rates inside of the herbivore exclosures where there was no browsing those trees were dying and the trees that were exposed to herbivory were doing all right so they looked closer at this and what they found was the browsing pressure on the trees stimulated the trees to produce nectar that they used to feed the ants when the trees were no longer um, being browsed they were essentially like okay well no point in producing this nectar, unnecessary expense. So they cut the ants off. In response, the ants were no longer able to defend the trees from beetles and other problematic insects. 
And so the trees were essentially getting rotted out and dying because they were no longer being defended by the ants. So you see there's these, you don't think of ants as having much of a direct relationship with giraffes, but there's this hidden interaction there. Mm -hmm. So going back to a conceptual model, if you make an effort at trying to organize your thoughts and mapping out your understanding of how an ecosystem works, you might find that there are some hidden connections that kind of illuminate themselves to you. So that's a good place to start. Start with a conceptual model, and then from there, find some, build some good questions. I don't think ecosystem monitoring usually has very positive outcomes when it's not being led by some really good questions. That's great. Yeah, I think it's important. I think we've gone down this path in my career the past few years, too, where it's kind of like monitoring done for the sake of monitoring, like just like we go after looking at collecting data on like certain aspects of urban forest ecosystem. And then obviously 10 years later, 15 years later, okay, what are these questions? What are we trying to answer you know, oh, for ourselves? Yeah. You know, sort of thing. But then also I think things um, kind of midterm too, if you are like into a decades long project, there's questions that appear, <laughs> right? That you wouldn't have necessarily asked at the get go, right? Like when you're sort of naive or you're new to the to a project or to an ecosystem, right? I think that's kind of my takeaway. Yeah, one of the takeaways that I just gathered from what you're saying. Yeah, we should talk about where <laughs> ecosystem monitoring goes off the rails because yeah, um, okay. there's a there's a lot of ways that it can go. I wrong. love that. Yeah, thank you. Let's do it. I have to say, ecosystem monitoring is it's a big part of my life. It's near and dear to my heart. It's a lot of what we do at Haven. But ecosystem monitoring is, uh, I would say, widely looked down upon in the sciences. It's uh, a lot of researchers, I feel like, kind of regard ecological monitoring as sort of the bastard child of science. And I think maybe where that's coming from is there is a lot of poor quality logical monitoring that's done. An example would be, I think you mentioned passive monitoring or monitoring where it just mm -hmm. seems to kind of aimlessly go on and on. I've seen that a lot. Sometimes I call it zombie monitoring. So this is this happens when a monitoring project got started. There may have been very good intentions, but maybe not some very well-defined questions guiding the methodology. And then an organization just continues doing the work over time, perhaps because of the, sometimes people call it the sunk cost fallacy. This idea that, oh, well, we've already put a lot of work into it, so we better keep throwing time and money at it um, because otherwise we will have lost what we had initially invested in it. It's a fallacy because if there's an initial mistake made, the real waste of resources is to just continue making that mistake over and over again. So... Zombie monitoring, that's a really mm -hmm. common thing I see. Just also fundamentally poor experimental design. I think ecological monitoring, it's done best when it's essentially following the scientific method. You can think of it as a generalization of the scientific method. You have um, some fundamental questions about the landscape, which you can think of as being another way of looking at uh, management goals and management ob objectives. So uh, if we're managing a forest and our goal is for it to have a uh, complex structure, you can flip that around and think of that as a question. If we do a prescribed burn, does it create complex structure? If we do a thinning treatment, does that create the structure that we're looking for? And that kind of question is what can guide really high quality ecosystem monitoring. Yeah, and you always want you want to start with those questions because once you have a, developed a very good scientific question, the methods follow. The methods just reveal themselves to you. It can be, I think, very inspiring to follow your imagination and just look at the array of tools that we now have available for doing ecosystem monitoring. We talked about uh, molecular methods like eDNA. A lot of terrestrial ecologists are probably very familiar with plot-based sampling or transect-based sampling. There's different tools for measuring the diversity and the structure of the environment. And these can help inspire the questions that you use to design an e ecological monitoring program, but you don't want the methods to determine the program. Right, right. Yeah, I'm trying to think of some concrete examples. Actually, the one that comes to mind right now, like we're surrounded by forest right now, is probably the most heavily forested part of Tacoma, 
obviously 700 some odd acres in the northern tip of the peninsula but there's like lidar being flown this year that will look at the urban forest canopy cover in the city right so that's a metric that that informs like a goal right for the city for urban ecology anyway is like a metric for like health perhaps is that more forest canopy is healthier for a place right so we're in the city where it has 20 percent canopy cover and there's some goals that have matured or kind of have evolved out of that thinking that we need 30 percent canopy cover 40 percent canopy cover and then we can see the places that um it's sort of obvious too. Do we need the data to tell us this that like places without canopy cover are the hottest in the city, <laughs> right? And then it's sort of like trees create shade. Yeah. And then also too, we can I think for examining kind of power relations, historical context, you can actually see that formerly red line communities and places that have been de- disinvested in, yeah, don't have tree canopy, don't have clean water or any water flowing through them, and so they're hotter, right? So um, there's things like that. I think they're like, um, yeah, little bits of data that are heavily invested in at, uh, like urban forestry or, um, kind of open space or forest, natural areas, forest restoration in cities anyway, that are, that are, um, yeah, like key metrics or elements we look at and they're heavily invested in. I'm not sure if, um, there's maybe a more mature or evolved question we should be asking. Maybe not. Maybe that's a good example, honestly. I'm trying to think of, like, really good examples, I guess. Like you said, what's the opposite of zombie monitoring mm. or pop-up monitoring? That's the other one is because a lot of ecological monitoring says, like, the bastard or whatever. Like, it's not, it's really hard to find funding for it as well. Funding right? is often. And sometimes... it's, it's very short term sometimes, too, where you really need, like, longer term, like, relationship and studies. Yeah, I think funding is often where a lot of ecological monitoring falls apart. Organizations will get some key turn grant, at least to get some monitoring going, but most funders are not interested in just contributing to somebody's general fund. So when people are overly reliant on grants, I think that often kind of undermines long-term ecosystem monitoring efforts, which is tough because it's a long-term investment to get that work done. I think that's where partnerships can come in. So when you have multiple stakeholders that have different skills, but complementary skills that can make ecosystem monitoring much more sustainable. Yeah, funding level. I think a lot of funding comes from the state. Do you see private investment in ecological monitoring happen at all? It's, again, this kind of comes back to the tragedy of the commons and just that ecosystem monitoring is a huge, there's a huge public benefit to it. So ultimately, most of the funding is coming from public sources. There's so many there's so many good examples of ecosystem monitoring for a plant ecologist like myself. Probably the most famous might be the USDA's FIA program, mm. Forest Inventory Analysis. Huge array of plots across the United States collecting metrics on forest structure and diversity over time. It's a very powerful program, a very rigorous protocol, and it's very well funded. So there's a large data set that's accrued over time. Is it kind of coarse data, sort of like bigger landscape level data, or you think it's kind of it gets down to inform things on the ground? Oh, it do, it really just depends on how the data is being used. People use we're talking about FIA mm-hmm. data. People use FIA for developing powerful statistical models, so that you can do projections, for example, of uh, the growth and yield of a forest. The data is sometimes used for more. I would say ecological research, for example, for evaluating how the species ranges of different trees are shifting as a response to climate change. So there's a lot of uses. In that vein, what makes ecological monitoring go right? So we talked a little bit about the application of the scientific method, how it can be used in the context of land management, where you develop questions, essentially flip side of your management goals, and think of the management actions as being the experiments that are being done. So having good, very well thought out questions informed by a conceptual model or informed by your meditation, thinking like a mountain, good questions are where it starts. I think the the best ecosystem learning programs I've seen have been led by some champion. There's been always some person in the organization that's been advocating for the program and carrying it forward 
across times when there's been organizational change. A really great example of that would be the Green Seattle Partnerships Forest Monitoring Program. It's over a decade old. There's been a wide range of changes in the staffing at Green Seattle Partnership, but there's always been somebody there that was advocating for the program, making sure that there was some budget going towards it and that plots were being reevaluated every year. So that's a really key to success, having a champion. Can we talk about the sexy part of data management? Oh, oh yeah. Because <laughs> I know it's like uh, quality control, quality assurance on the data coming in. So I don't want to take you sideways, but I know you uh, it's a bear, right? Is it all in Excel <laughs> or is it like in access or what sort of what sort of the tools do you use to manage the data? It depends on the scope of the program. Excel makes me cringe, but honestly, it's very accessible and useful way of managing data for a lot of people. There's other table formats that are a little more commonly used by data scientists, like CSV files. For larger, more complex data sets, you have to have a, a relational database. So that could look like SQLite, that could look like Microsoft Access. Yeah, data integrity is actually another Im important component of a successful program. And that's been the source of the demise for a lot of programs. For example, if a ecosystem monitoring has a change in methodology, that can cause potential changes in the magnitude or the range of the data that's being collected and could cause spurious results in the analysis. So yeah, maintaining data integrity. And what that often can look like is just extremely good documentation, making sure that people know why certain decisions were made, making sure that a protocol is truly repeatable and that people understand the meaning of the data that's being collected. Like all of a sudden, we're going to start measuring this other thing, but we didn't measure it before. And that gets to methodology as well. So talk about green sale partnership is like the circular plot. And then often we learn a lot of other people, maybe in college, learn like line transects, is which we use. And there's things like surrogates for, I think, ecosystem health that we record like vegetative cover, the natives, or production on height or production on trees, because you can't sample, go around and sample everything in an area, right? Like in this whole 700 acres of park that we're sitting in, you have to take like little snapshots, correct? To kind of derive some sort of indication of what's happening or something that's representative, I guess, of what you see happening. That's right. Or yeah. representative of what you see in your model, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, there's some forms of environmental monitoring where you are, in fact, capable of measuring everything. So like with remote sensing, if you run a LiDAR flight, you've effectively measured everything everywhere. But when it comes to ecological monitoring, we're actually trying to understand very specific details about the diversity or the structure of an ecosystem. It's just too complex. There's not enough time or resources to study every twig in the forest. And so we have to resort to plot-based sampling. This goes back to statistics where there's some sort of a parameter. It's part of the this hypothetical population. So, for example, if we're talking about forest structure, there's the parameter of the basal area of the trees. And it's a thing, it's a parameter that we might imagine hypothetically is exist everywhere continuously in the forest, but we need to collect smaller samples of it at a given location, at a scale that, in this case, measuring trees, where you have enough trees that would be representative of that parameter. One thing I find really disappointing with ecosystem monitoring programs is data hoarding. And it doesn't necessarily undermine a program, but it's I see this as very common. Organizations will hide their data. They don't make it open access. They don't share it with the world. And I think ultimately they end up really missing out on potential partnerships, whether it's with undergraduate researchers that are just interested in exploring the data, private firms that might be able to use that to provide new services. It, I see this both with private organizations, nonprofits, as well as government agencies that will have uh, really tight IP data sharing agreements. They're more like data not sharing agreements. And it, there's, just, there's so much ecosystem monitoring data out there that's not out there. Not everything needs to be open access, and there are some potential harms that can happen if data is being shared and it's being interpreted poorly based on the wrong assumptions. But I think more often there's a lot of benefit to be gained from sharing data. Where do you think that mentality comes from? Is it a kind of a risk management perspective? or And then two, alternatively, 
a good question I think to you is like how to best share it. Where are the portals? Like how do you share? Like how do we put it out there? Yeah, I'm not sure the where internet. that instinct comes from. I'm sure part of it is just this instinct that we inherit from our own culture that is very f- focused on property and owning things, controlling things. Yeah, this weird instinct to control stuff. I think people perhaps sometimes wrongly assume that if they were to let the data out in the world, that they'd be missing out on some benefit from it. Whereas if it's just sitting in a filing cabinet, there's no benefit there. So The file cabinet analogy is so, yeah, critical. There's like plans that go in the file cabinet or on the shelf, the data that just kind of goes on the shelf, the folder or the cloud that's locked down, that's not public, just goes in there and just sits for like years or decades and no one looks at it. Especially when you say like, monitoring is so underfunded and there's not enough of it going on like why not actually share it and allow people to like analyze it and kind of give a new perspective on it yeah i think yeah people have this perception that if oh if i was to share this data publicly and then uh, someone else was able to learn from it or benefit from it as if that would be a personal loss and it's just a different way of thinking about things if we approach things from a more communalist perspective where we all benefit mutually from invention and discovery. I try to encourage that perspective as much as possible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I try to encourage people to be generous with their data. Exactly. Do you have a dream project? Yeah, yeah. We talked about eDNA and the potential use of spiderweb. That's my big dream project right now is the possibility of deploying this technology in the Pacific Northwest and learning more about the animals that are all around us, but we might not, we just might not see them because, Mm -hmm. because we're big and scary and they're small and shy. Yeah. Hey man, are you lost? You good? Oh yeah. How's it going? Something like that. Yeah. We're ecologists, I guess. Oh yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. I appreciate it. All right. Have a good walk. See what happens when we're come out in the forest and do free range podcasting. I don't know if you can hear that animal. I don't know what that is. Is that a chipmunk? Is that a bird? I don't know. But chipmunk, there's a a good Douglas squirrel right there. I don't know if my sensitive microphone is even catching it. I don't know. Every once in a while, it's been a while. I used to just go out and with this recorder when I first got it and just, just get like waves or rainfall or streams trickling. I thought it would be I've good. always wanted to do that. I feel like I'm often surrounded by just beautiful sounds in the world that I want to share and be able to experience again. I mean, this is another sort of like almost pop science thing, but it is embedded within like the sound ecosystem. I don't know what to call it. The quiet, measuring quiet and sound. So there's that guy, like the one square inch project. Have you heard of that? Mm -hmm. Who just goes out with very sensitive equipment and records sounds like deep in the Olympic rainforest Mm -hmm. or whatever. So, I mean, that's, we often think of measuring like structural things, right? Things that have some mass to them, but also there's like the space between, or there's, yeah, the, the ecosystem, like the ecology of light as well. There's all these things that are sort of things that we're surrounded by, I guess, that we sort of take for granted. This sort of reminds me of just this, basic aspect of quantum mechanics where just the very act of observation causes changes in the phenomena that we're seeing. This is one of the things that I, why I find the idea of eDNA analysis, eDNA sequencing very inspiring because we can learn about what's out there in the natural world more remotely, either in terms of space or time. So we're not out there scaring it away. All right, I need your consent for rapid fire questions. Let's All right, go. let's do a couple. Just with one word, what is ecological restoration? Healing. What's the most useless talent you have? I'm really good at taking naps. If I if there's just no reason to be fully conscious, like I can just straight up take a nap like on the spot. Doesn't matter like how loud it is, doesn't matter what's going on, how much chaos there is in the world, what kind of presidential debate I just witnessed, like I can just, you know, have yeah. you heard of the nap ministry? I've not heard of that. Like, I was at Machu Picchu, and I was just like, you know what? I'm going to sleep right here in the middle of these ruins. I did it. That's a superpower. It's not useless. We can talk about that more later. Man, I'm all about napping. 
If animals could, if animals could talk, which one would be the rudest? That's got to be crows. I yeah. love crows. Don't get me wrong, but yeah. every time I see crows harassing a barred owl or a bald eagle, I just I get the feeling like they're shouting very crass insults. Nice. Did have a former podcast interview with the crow guy? Can't remember his name right now. John Marslove. Yeah, yeah. We talked about crows a little bit. Okay, if you could switch lives with the cat for a day. What's the first thing you do? Oh, straight up climb a tree. Mm. I love trees. There's a part of my brain that's, I think, forever devoted to designing the perfect tree house. And whenever I see animals or birds just scurrying around in the canopy, I just wish I could be up there too. So that's definitely climb a tree. Nice. Maybe take a nap. Combining answers to questions, extra points. Um, if you could only listen to one song for the rest of your life, what would it be? Oh, that is such a good question. Um, Thank you. I want to say My Sweet Lord by George Harrison. It just fills me with so much joy. I do, in fact, listen to it on repeat. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll have to put, I'll put a link to, in, to that in the show notes for people to listen to. You could wrap up the podcast with... Do you have it on cassette tape or DVD, CD? Or you listen Spotify. to it to stream it? All right, I got you. I thought you might have had it on like an A-track from your parents or something. <laughs> It's a newer song. No, George it's Harrison, one. you're talking about like Beatles, yeah. George Harrison, yeah. right? All right, I got you. Nice. Do you want other rapid fire questions? Sure. This, is a, this one might be a trick question. You okay with this one? Let's what's go. your fa- What's your favorite process by which plants convert sunlight into, ener- into energy? The Calvin cycle. Absolutely. Is it? No, wait. Okay. <laughs> There's Photo- multiple processes. Photosynthesis. <laughs> Oh, I just, <laughs> that is a I, trick question. I know, I mess with you because I said your favorite. <laughs> Which is there maybe only one process. That's a good okay. Um, if you could invent a holiday, what would it be called and how would it be celebrated? You, know, you should ask people is, which is your favorite photo system, one or two? <laughs> oh, I don't have an answer for that. Um, photo system two because you can use it for um, monitoring plant stress using oh. the FV over FM uh, variable fluorescence metric. Okay. I'll put a link to that in the show notes too. Did you hear that last? Do you hear that last question? If you could invent a holiday, what would what would it be called and how would it be celebrated? Oh, that's way too. Don't worry about it. If you had to wear a t shirt with one word on it for the rest of your life, what would you choose? These are ridiculous, dude. What would be the title of your autobiography? Not what I was expecting. Okay. If you could eat one food for the rest of your life, what would it be? Definitely chana masala. Ooh, damn. So hungry right now. Let's end it on chana masala. Bam. So good. All right. Well, thank you for uh, sit- sitting in the sacred Western Hemlock Forest with me. Appreciate I appreciate coming down. Thanks for bringing me out into the woods. I was not expecting this to be our studio. Thank you, Dylan, for sharing your expertise, stories, and inspiring insights. It's truly motivating to hear about the ways ecological monitoring connects us to the wider world and how it can help us make informed, impactful decisions for a sustainable future. And thank you, listeners, again, for joining us on this journey through the heart of ecosystem science. If you enjoyed today's episode and want to support our work, please consider donating to keep the Treehugger podcast thriving. Your contributions allow us to bring these valuable conversations to a larger audience. And every bit helps us continue the work of exploring and protecting our natural world. There's someone else I want to call out and thank. It's Katie Dunn. I know you're out there. I really appreciate you circling back around with your interest in ecological restoration and storytelling through the podcast. Katie is almost famous for assisting with the local oak novella episode a while back if we're going back to the Wayback Machine. And with much gratitude, I love the help editing this episode and getting it out the door into everyone else's ears. Thank you, Katie. Round of applause and snaps out there in podcast land. Everyone else, don't forget to subscribe, share, and leave us a review if you haven't already. We look forward to bringing you more insightful conversations with change makers like Dylan. Until next time, keep connecting with wider nature and nurturing the forest and the community around you. See you in the woods.